Hello, hello, everyone. Happy Friday. Welcome, welcome, welcome. We're just giving it a minute or so for all of our podcast community members to get settled in to um, today's programming. So excited to be here with you today. Happy New Year to each of you. I think the second week of January is still appropriate to say that, right? But I am so glad to be reunited with each of you. I was out last week, so certainly want to give a shout out to my colleague, Cosette Strong, for leading our Intentional Conversations podcast and doing a phenomenal job. I hope you all are having a tremendous week. Please go to the chat. Let us know where you're joining the conversation from. It's always a treat for us to be able to see where people are joining the conversation from. So place that into the chat. Also, if you feel inclined to share any other information about yourself that you want us to know, maybe even dropping your LinkedIn information into the chat, that is a great way for you to let us know that you desire to be in community with this vodcast community, even outside of this window of time that we're here together today. We do have closed caption that is available. That is our way at NWC being very intentional about disability inclusion. So if that's of use and a benefit to you, then we hope that you take advantage of it. Cameras today are encouraged. We love to see smiling faces, but certainly not required. If you're just participating in an auditory capacity, then we are so glad. Um, nonetheless, we are just glad that you're here and you're taking this time to be able to visit with us and be a part of our community. I want to give a special shout out to the NWC team who works tirelessly day in and day out um, across all of our many different efforts, but including our Intentional Conversations podcast. And so thank you all for the work that you do. We are so glad to be in um, community and partnership with each of you. So we have a great program today, and I cannot wait for you to hear from our special guest co-hosts. Um, but in the meantime, sit back, get settled in, and welcome again to Intentional Conversations Podcast. Conversations begin indeed. And so once again, I am Dr. Nika White. My pronouns are she, her, hers, and I serve as founder and lead principal consultant for NWC. And we are so glad that you're here today. If you are um, new to our community, one of the things that we like to do is always start off with a couple different slides where we share some information about what's going on with NWC, as well as we will put into your hearing some of the national observances. Um, again, just as our way of deepening our knowledge and understanding of all the many ways in which we celebrate and honor and acknowledge um, diversity of all types. And so Braille Literacy Month is this month, the month of January. And so you may not be aware of this, but until recently, individuals with disabilities could not count on their work environment being completely accessible. That's very true. And so it wasn't until the Americans with Disabilities Act of 1990 that discrimination against people with disabilities was legal. Many organizations at that time newly began considering accessibility and disability under the DEIB umbrella, which has shed new light on what it means to be a truly inclusive organization. So I certainly want you all to be aware that this month is special because it is Braille Literacy Month. Okay. Something else I want to share with you, we all know this because it is coming upon us. Actually, we celebrate this nationally as an observance on Monday, but it is Martin Luther King Jr. Day. So we hope that you are already making plans, if there aren't already solidified, to find a way to reflect, to honor the legacy of Dr. King in whatever way that feels appropriate to you. We want to make sure that we don't continue to um, just go through every single year and, um, and not acknowledging the true depth of how he has created so much equity and belonging for so many people in so many ways. And we're really grateful for his life and his legacy. So happy birthday to you, Dr. King. Now, if you're part of this community, you also know that I have been sharing with you bits and bits of what's happening with my book number three release. And we are in the month of the actual pub date. January 31st is the date. I cannot be more excited. It is called Inclusion Uncomplicated, a transformative guide to simplify DEI. And that is in partnership with my publisher, Forbes Books. It is available right now on pre-order at Amazon. But when January 31 hits, you can get it from Amazon and anywhere that you like to purchase 
purchase your books, including Barnes and Nobles, but anywhere, even if there's an independent bookstore, maybe a black independent bookstore that you want to support in your local area, check them out and um, you should be able to get inclusion uncomplicated. But thank you so much for your support that you have provided to me. This has been a labor of love and I cannot wait to get this book into the hands of as many people as possible. I do want to let you know that we have a great opportunity coming up on February the 2nd. This is going to be our virtual book launch event, and I'm excited because it's going to be hosted by the Menda Hearts. Many of you are very familiar with Menda Hearts, the author of the memo, Right Within. She has several other books, great accolades and credentials, but look her up if you don't know her. But join us. It's going to be virtual from 530 to 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. It will be on Zoom. It will also go live on LinkedIn, and registration information will be forthcoming. But I just want to start planning this seeds now so that you can protect that date and time. And join me and the rest of the team at NWC for the virtual book launch event for Inclusion Uncomplicated. Okay. More exciting news at NWC. We took some time at the end of year to revamp our website with our partners at Peculiar. They are amazing. If you don't know them, they are our marketing communications firm, and they have been rocking it with me forever, literally forever. I can't even give you the number of years because it's been forever, but they have refreshed our website. It's nikawhite.com. We invite you to go and check that out. We have some new products and services that we're launching this year and just overall a more seamless site. And so I want you to experience it and let us know what you think. Okay, so if you've been enjoying our intentional um, conversations podcast and you think the content has been rich and been useful and you want to share it with others, but maybe the people that you're thinking about sharing it with, they more so like to get their content from a podcast capacity. Well, guess what? The intentional conversations podcast is also available in podcasts. And so you see the platforms on the screen and we hope that you will take the same rich content and take it on the go and let others know they can access it in that way as well. Now, one of the things that we like to do is give you a head knock of what you have to look forward to in future weeks. And so next week, we will be right back here, 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time with another live Intentional Conversations podcast. And I am so happy because we're going to be welcoming Claudia Miller. And we're going to be discussing how more women um, can get into leadership roles and how can companies empower their women and employees and why women sometimes have a hard time advocating for themselves, right? It's not bragging if it happened, right? So it's more flagging. So we need to make sure we get better about telling those stories. And so she's going to be with us on January 20th, next Friday. And I hope that you will be with here, here with us as well. Now, it does me great pleasure. This is the time in the program where I get the opportunity to officially introduce today's guest co-host. And I am super excited. The timing worked out perfectly because we know that Black History Month, this particular individual is going to be high in demand and probably not able to catch. But how lucky are we, Vodcast community, to be able to have Emmanuel Kulu? I'm going to refer to him as Kulu because I understand that most of his friends do that. And well, yeah, I, I'm considering myself a friend, Kulu. But as I normally do, I want to give his official bio because it helps us to understand the accolades, the credentials, and how our guest co-hosts will show up to the conversation. So allow me to do that at this time. Emmanuel Kulu Jr. is an African historian, author of the Cameroonian descent Zulu Bantu tribe. As an African historian, Kulu has traveled both nationally and internationally giving lectures, seminars, and conferences on the miseducation of African history at various high schools, colleges, and universities. Based on his thorough research, Kulu created a historical fiction adventure series based on true events, and it's called I, Black Pharaoh, Rise to Power, and I, Black Pharaoh, Golden Age of Triumph. These novels were published and released in 2020 and 2021, respectively, by Pennant Publications. Both novels restore the true African imagery of ancient Egypt. In 2022, Kulu founded ARIA, which stands for Ancient African Antiquities Research Institute of America, a mouthful, but you need to know that full name, with the mission of creating a middle and high school curriculum for African studies, something that's so needed. 
This curriculum will provide educational diversity and new understanding of the inclusion of African studies within world history for both educators and students. And so podcast community, if you've been with us, you know what to do now is take to the chat, find those emojis or whatever reactions, and let's certainly welcome our guest co-host today, Emmanuel Kulu. Kulu is what I'm going to refer to him as, um, but we certainly want to make sure that he knows that he is um, welcomed and, um, and that we really appreciate him being here. So Kulu, I'm going to spotlight you um, so that we can bring you into the fold. And um, I just want you in your own way to please acknowledge this audience, greet this audience. And what I want you to think about is you're opening up with whatever type of um, greeting that you want to provide is to maybe share something with us that we would not know about you from reading your bio. That's always a question that we like to toss in there. So welcome, my friend. How are you? I am doing well. I am so grateful. Greetings, family, uh, all my people around the world. So grateful to be here and to see everyone. Um, something that you may not know about me, I am African on my father's side from Cameroon and Bantu, Bantu Zulu tribe. And on my mother's side, my mother is an African-American. She actually was affiliated with the Black Panther movement in the 70s. And she is what really got me into educating. But my father on the other side, he helped me to get into African history. So I combined the Pan-Africanness of my mother and I combined the African history from my father. And this is what you got today is me. I love that. Giving homage where it is due certainly to your parents. And that's beautiful. So I want to jump right in because this hour is going to go by really fast. And I feel like there's so much that we can delve into that's going to be of interest to this community. And so um, you talk often about having a solution to change the narrative of Black African history. And I shared some of that in your bio. So what is your solution exactly? Tell us what that is. Well, what I, what I want to do with Aria is to establish a new understanding of African studies. Usually to get into African studies, you have to get into college and you have to take a special course. We believe that it needs to start from K through 12 mm -hmm. to know about the diversity of Black African history. Now, you can't start history from the middle of the book or three quarters towards the end. You have to start Black history at the beginning. Mm -hmm. We know that Black history goes further back past the transatlantic slave trade. So I want to bring forth the 6,000 years of African history that has been excluded from world history as we know it today. So to reestablish that, get that going in this, the, the education curriculums, we have built um, our own curriculum and we're going to be presenting it starting in New York State first because that's where I'm at. That's where I am. And then we're going to try to venture out to other states to get them to accept our curriculum as well. Love that. So starting in New York, but we'll certainly make its way. And we're claiming it because we all need it all over the country. And, you know, we know that there's a lot of conversations right now about the lack of true um, Black history, African-American history that's taught in the schools. And so we certainly appreciate all of your efforts. So I think there's so many theories out there, Kulu, but um, I would love for you to talk from your perspective of why was Black history and why is it still so distorted for so many? Well, in, in the times when the transatlantic slave trade happened, you have many things that were used as a tool to keep African-American people uh, redlined, so to speak. Um, and that was educational, that was economical, that was financial, that was even, you know, as I mentioned, in education. So in order to have that happen, you cannot allow a people to know how great their history was. So mm -hmm. if a people believe that they're historyless or have no history or no significant contribution to world history, here they are, they're just lost. They just, they're here, but they really have no contribution. So yeah. that being said, this is why it's been distorted because if people were to believe that um, they had great civilizations before America, before their tran the transatlantic slave trade, they would be inclined to have that Sankofa mentality to look back and reclaim what they once had. And this is mm -hmm. something that in the early days of history, um, they did not, well, world history that was created by the Western civilization didn't want that to be known. Mm, yeah, no, so true. That's really that's really good context for us to be aware of. So do you think that the miseducation of Black history today, does it affect the workplace? 
And how oh, so? Absolutely. If so, absolutely. Yeah. If if someone looks at you and and looks at you as a history list person, like you have no history, you've done nothing, you had no contribution unless you were directed to do it. They're going to look at you as if you're valueless. Like you know, yeah. you, you need to do what we say, or you're gone, because you don't have any value. You've contributed nothing without us. So what makes you think <laughs> that we need you? So, but to know a person knows their history, and knows that they've contributed to many different things that we have today, um, that would not allow. It wouldn't it wouldn't allow for that type of treatment to happen to people. So I think history is a big part of the DEI space as well. Oh, I absolutely agree. I love the way that you articulated that. In many ways, it feels like erasure, right? You know, it feels like we're invisible as Black people in the workplace when, um, you know, that that's not acknowledged in terms of all the many different contributions, which is why I love this time of year, how there is a greater um, amplification of Black joy, right? We talk a lot about Black resilience, which is important as well. We don't want to negate any of that, but I think that the Black joy that comes out of that Black resistance is also equally important. And um, and I'm loving how many workplaces, not all, more should be doing this, but how many workplaces are trying to really create that good balance of, of both of those messages. So why is a ancient Egypt so important to Black history? Educate us today, Kulu. Well, as you may well have known, this recent situation has come out, but I've been going through this for years. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what happened with Kevin Hart's situation, uh, which is more recent. Um, the cancelization of his um, his show that he had in Egypt has brought yeah. more light to the situation and why Egypt is so important in Black history. When you talk about Pythagoras or you're talking about Aristotle or you talk about any of these Greek philosophers, by unanimous testimony, they said that these ancient Egyptian people were Black African people. So if they these Greek philosophers who are not African people, who mentioned that these people, not this is not also to mention what we can see in the temples in Luxor or Naswan and in Cairo, we can see that these were African people. But now we have confirmation from Greek scholars who are not African and other scholars like Constantine Devolny, who mentioned that these were Black African people who built this great civilization. Mm -hmm. So it's very important to, as I mentioned earlier, the Sankofa, to look back and fetch it. So if you can look past the transatlantic slave trade, look past the Middle Passage and look past, um, you know, even what we see in West, what was happening in Western Africa with yeah. the great Mali uh, kingdom, Agzum in Eastern Africa, the Zulu kingdom of my ancestors. We look past that going into 3200 BC, ancient Kush, ancient Kemet is what Egypt was originally called. Now you're reclaiming thousands of years of history. And we can see even things like the White House, things were built based off of the ancient mystery schools of ancient Egypt. So you're essentially saying, if this was a part of Black history, you're saying that a lot of this Black history taught other civilizations that followed, i.e. the Romans, <laughs> the Greeks, and even the Anglo-American power that we see today that followed some of the same traditions yeah. of these ancient Black African people. I love that. I mean, that that just deserves a pause. Let's take that all in. Let's make sure we're receiving <laughs> I this know message. it's deep. <laughs> I mean, it is really deep, but we appreciate that you're educating us today, Kulu. Um, one of our podcast community members placed into the chat, it wasn't a trade, it was human trafficking. And yeah, language is important. Let's really call it what it is that is critical. So we have February that's just right around the corner. And, you know, there's so many people, of course, that always says that while February is the month that there's a lot of additional fanfare and amplification of, of Black history and Black joy and Black resilience that um, we should not just relegate, you know, these conversations to that one month. And so what's your response to that? And what else could be done to ensure that there's celebrations and Black history and education happening all throughout the year? Well, if you if people for those who do follow me, you know, my hashtag is Black History 365. Um, you can't limit Black history to one month. That's First and foremost, you're talking about thousands of years of history, contribution, even right here in America. There are there are more than th more than 28 days is is 
had, you can't, you're doing an injustice to black history just in America in 28 days. So when you're talking about African, the entire African black diaspora, you're mm. talking a lot of thousands of years of history. Yeah. You cannot do that. You can't cover it in, 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 in a month, in the shortest month of the year, by the way. Right. So I think it's something, a conversation that needs to be had more and more throughout the year, acknowledging uh, holidays like Juneteenth, acknowledging mm -hmm. uh, other accomplishments of African people outside of what we know today. And this yes. is why I say we must provide that new information so that we can include a lot of these other accomplishments that happened in other months besides February. Absolutely. I totally agree. And you're part of that solution, Kulu, through the curriculum and your platform and your messaging. So thank you so much for that. So organizations right now, some are well prepared, some are scrambling to try to figure out what's going to be our Black History Month programming, right? So how can organizations acknowledge and support individuals celebrating Black History Month? What should organizations have thought about a long time ago to be prepared for just a couple of weeks away? Well, first of all, you have to enlighten yourself. If you're not enlightened, um, you, you're just going to be in the dark. And sometimes ignorance is, is an excuse. And other times it's you know, people willingly do it. So we have to get enlightened. We have to get in tune with uh, things like LinkedIn, social media yeah. channels like LinkedIn can get you connected with educators like myself, people like yourself, people who are in mm -hmm. the DEI spaces. We're in the age of information. Ignorance yeah. is no longer an excuse. It's, so it's sure. a click of a button right now. So you have to get connected. You have to spend some money. You're going to have to do that, <laughs> by the way, um, because you're going to have to need specialists that know these this stuff that can come and assist with you and partner with you to um, to build your awareness in your team. Absolutely. And I love that you're amplifying the fact that resources abound. And so we need to take that off of the list of excuses and reasons, right? Because I mean, there are way too many films and books and webinars and classes. I mean, way too many resources for people to stay, to remain ignorant about Black history. And so that is certainly a good message that we too want to push here through today's conversation. So I want to move a little bit and I want to talk about how racism has played a role in the miseducation through our common core curriculum of Black history. Can you speak to that a little bit, Kulu? Well, when you look into history, you start to see around the 1800s, towards the 19th century, you started to see a shift away from ancient Egypt being a Black African civilization. Because in, in 1700s, you had a scholar by the name of Constantine the Volney who mentioned that he his quote, famous quote was, just think, this very race of Black men, today subject of our scorn, is to the very people we owe our art, science, and even our use of speech. So we can see at that particular time, the general consensus at that time is that ancient Egypt was a Black African civilization. And it started to shift in the 18th in the 18th century to more eurocentric you started to see egyptians being lightened up their their um yeah. their sculptures you started to see the imagery through film through books through novels um to be portrayed as something other than african you started to see Egypt be separated from Africa, so to speak, or it's in Africa, but it's something, it's more uh, Middle Eastern or more uh, European, so to speak. You started to see that imagery and this imagery started to affect the minds of filmmakers um, and it perpetuated from there on. So, yeah. um, and, and then again, when a people look at you as you have no history, I mean, they don't think very much of you. Yeah, so, you're erased. You're invisible. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So you're getting actually to one of the, the next questions I was going to, to, to go to, which is regarding how film and media has played a role in um, the miseducation and even in degrading Black history. And so I want you to, to expound upon that a little bit further. So when you have a film being made, and I've been in the film industry as well, if you check my bio, you'll see that I've done, I was a part of the first Purge mm -hmm. film. Um, but also, um, they have what they call a casting director. So when a casting sense. director comes to, uh, figure out who's going to cast for certain roles, and then you see Elizabeth Taylor as Cleopatra, which I love Elizabeth Taylor, by <laughs> the way, shout out to her. But when you see her as Cleopatra, that's not done by accident. 
Okay. Yeah. And then you have the people who are considered to be the slaves in that film. You're seeing them as black people. So uh, that's not an accident that that happened. Yeah. That happens on purpose. Um, so again, film has played a very big part. Richard Nixon once said that the American people won't believe anything unless they see it on television. So <laughs> therefore it, 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 it's really telling lies to vision, so to speak, so that people believe these things. I mean, there's, there's, there, I'm sure the audience can attest to the times where they've heard someone say, that's not true. I didn't see it on TV. Yeah. <laughs> so you, we've heard that a million times. So we know that imagery has a big part to play in the miseducation. I mean, you got Gods of Egypt. One of my favorite films was Ten, The Ten Commandments. I love that because I'm a spiritual man. Um, but at the same time, it still holds that same weight of uh, miseducation on who these people actually were. Yeah, I love that. And, you know, part of our growth, just as individuals, right, our growth to, to help center humanity and to, to definitely um, center the needs of the most marginalized, which I, I will go down, you know, saying that it's definitely the Black, you know, African-American population. Part of that journey is about unlearning misinformation that has caused us to, to, um, to not fully have appreciation and, and correct understanding. And so I love the fact that part of this subliminal message that we're sending today through this conversation is we have to unlearn the misinformation because we know that the history, the Black history that has been taught is flawed, but we have to unlearn that misinformation in order for us to grow stronger and really be able to place the right type of um, of appreciation of all of the contributions of Black African Americans. And so thank you for that. Um, when you was, say that, was, Nika, when you say yeah. that, Nika, you also have to understand, we also have to understand in order for miseducation to fly, everyone yeah. has to be miseducated, not just yeah. Black people. Let's make that yes. very clear. <laughs> everyone had, the entire world has to be absolutely in order for this type of miseducation yeah. uh, and dishonest scholarship to continue. So this doesn't just affect Black people. This affects everyone. We've all been miseducated. Yeah. And that's something yeah. that we should take a stand against. No, I love that. I love the fact that you very intentionally used the word scholarship as you were making that statement, because as I read in your bio, this is all, people can check this out for themselves. This is all steeped in research. This is not just Kulu's story, right? And I think that's what um, is important for us to note as well. I was tickled a little when you brought up the fact that there are some people who say, well, that's not true because I didn't see it on TV. And it brought to my remembrance, um, you know, rest his soul, George Floyd, about how so many people were in denial that racism existed, right? until it was on national television played over and over again it was hard it was visual but that's when some people started to really believe something's wrong and i think that's why we saw such this huge uh, shift of organizations who were kind of on the sidelines then beginning to say we need to do something. We do have power and influence as a large corporate entity or as just an organization with a, a, a deep well of influence. And, and we need to now start doing something more than just um, letting those social justice, you know, agencies and entities deal with, with these types of things. And so, yes, it doesn't have to be on TV to see it. We need to believe Black people. We need to, <laughs> um, yes, you know, believe them. Absolutely, hands down. And so I just wanted to bring that to the conversation. So as we were, you know, talking about trolls and people that um, perhaps can have a different stance or position other than the one that you that you share in your messaging platform, I want to understand what is some of the most common pushback that you get from those critics regarding your messaging and your stance, and, and how do you respond? Well, um, the, very similar to what Kevin Hart was experiencing. Um, I've been accused of blackwashing ancient Egypt. Mm. I've been accusing of, of accused of being a liar. I mean, my first, I think my first 20 posts uh, from my book were very negative comments. Mm. And in fact, there were so many comments that I personally reported. Um, over 100 of my reviews were deleted. Um, that were mm -hmm. positive. So they mixed up a lot of positive ones with the negative ones. So wow. Amazon, please do something about that, by the way. But <laughs> I, you know, please a fast clicking in a hurry because my book <laughs> is coming out. <laughs> so it happens. I've noticed it happened with a, another friend of mine. Yeah. Um, you know, people, trolls just get on there. And at yeah. first, 
when I first published my book, it affected me so badly that I wanted to give up. I mm. talked to my father before about it and I said, you know, pops, you know, is this something that I really want to pursue? I want to deal with people from all over the world saying these negative things. And, you know, he said, you know, when you're going to speak the truth, even, <laughs> even our <laughs> Lord and Savior, even our Lord and Savior went through pain. <laughs> so yeah. Here, yeah. You know, he only had 12 friends, right? So at that <laughs> time, so at that time, people just didn't want to hear, incline their ear to anything true. So that yeah. really encouraged me to keep going, you know, have faith, trust the research that you've done, you know, uh, mm -hmm. connect with other people who believe the same thing and continue to, to, to speak back scholarly. But at that point, I started to shift away from the debates, so to speak, mm -hmm. because I had mm -hmm. been in so many debate battles with people in regards to the uh, Africana, uh, the Africanness of ancient Egypt. Mm -hmm. It just came to the point where now I don't debate it. I teach it and I, mm -hmm. I can prove it to you um, if you listen. So um, that's why where I stand on it. I tried my best not to get into any disputes about things that are facts and have been proven a million times over yeah, save your energy, save your peace. But I love what you just said. That was so powerful. I don't I don't get into debates. Now I just teach. I'm bringing you facts. It's hard to argue with facts, but if you want to, then do that on your own because I'm not going to argue with you about facts, right? Mm -hmm. And I so love that. Um, so I stand in solidarity with you, and I'm glad that you have this, this change perspective about maybe some of those negative comments and trolls that were after you because, yes, if you're in this space, it's going to happen. It, it almost is a part of the territory. And so we just have to um, press through, right? Press through and just know that while there may be a percentage of people that are going to negate what you say, there's also a larger percentage. I truly believe that of people that are going to support what you're doing and what you say, because it is the right thing. It's absolutely the right thing. And so I wanted to um, encourage you in that regard. So I want to say one thing to though, Nika. Please do. One thing that really gave me some light is uh -huh. right after the book came out, Black Panther came out. Oh, so you're yeah. starting to see a lot of people outside of the African diaspora <laughs> that were really embracing African culture. And that's kind of when the hate hate stopped. So shout out to Ryan Kruger and Marvel for that because uh, I started to get a lot more support. Yes. So shout out to Black Panther. Absolutely. And, and congrats to the whole the whole team and crew for, for the awards that they recently were recognized for. But um, but yeah, so I don't know if the timing was intentional because, you know, you really can't plan those things. But I'm sure that it um, certainly did not hurt that, you know, there was some great synergy in the timing of the Black Panther. Um, but yeah, so I, I appreciate that. I'll, I'll stay here for one second because one of the I was talking to my publisher just the just yesterday, in fact, and um, in anticipation of January 31 pub date. And because um, I have a friend who was sharing that and, and she has an incredible book, incredible book, but she was sharing that someone had um you know, placed a negative review on her book. And, and I'm fuming because I thought we have to protect the full turf. When that happens to one of us, it happens to all of us. And so I'm thinking, yes. okay, what can we do? And that's not right. And because it was clear the person did not read the book. And I remember my, uh, my contacts at Forbes Books were saying to me, it's going to happen. So just kind of, you know, get used to it just because it's, it's part of like people's nature to not necessarily always want to do right by you. And they said exactly what you said, just ignore it because most people are able to see right through that. And so I just, again, I wanted to circle back just to share those words with you that were um, deposited into me that I felt a little bit of um, security around. That's a neutral um, friend of birth of ours, by the way. <laughs> yes. Yes. I, I figured you would know who I'm talking yeah. about. Yeah. Yes. Um, okay. Fantastic. So tell us about about your historical fiction adventure series. Why is it important to have fictional stories like this, right? Well, so people could say, that's a, that's a little odd. This is a serious matter. Right, well, this is my book is historical fiction. So it, it, it does have the creative side. The fiction comes from my creativity that was added to the actual historical facts that happened um, in ancient history. So the series is about uh, the, the greatest Pharaoh uh, his name was Tutmosis III. He is known in the book as the Black Pharaoh. And the Black Pharaoh does not mean Black skin Pharaoh. So let's make that very clear to all the listeners okay. out there. The Black was a term that Egyptians used for the ascended or transcended into a God form. So this was like the Pharaoh of the completion. So when you hear the term Black Pharaoh, it means Pharaoh of completion. Okay, so this, just to make that clear, when you go to ancient Egypt, you might see 
statues painted completely jet black. That was like a form of com this Pharaoh completed his course. He has ascended into the spiritual realm. This is what the e ancient Egyptian people of Kemet believed. So this is why that term is there to make that clear for everyone. And it's also about the greatest queen Pharaoh. We always hear about Cleopatra, but mm -hmm. Hatshepsut was an African woman who ruled the known world for over 20 years. Now we've never seen uh, a, a woman president yet, but this was an African woman who ruled the known world. This is when ancient Egypt was the world power, was the mega civilization of the world. And there was a black woman at the helm of this civilization. Mm -hmm. So I decided to turn this series of this great conquering Pharaoh and this great ruling uh, sister named Hapshetsut and tell this story in a historical fiction manner um, to bring this, to transport people into the majesty of ancient Africa and show how beautiful it was under these African rulers. I love that. Thank you for getting the sisters in there. Absolutely. Um, Michael, who's actually part of our podcast community. And in fact, he is the one that connected the two of us for this opportunity. So thank yes. you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, but he plays from Black Pharaoh to Black Panther into the chat, which I thought was incredibly <laughs> cute. And then we have Takiya, who is saying, we'd love to talk about the rich Black American culture that has been suppressed. Yeah, there's so much of that. So tell us about um, Aria. And again, as I said in the beginning, that is Ancient African Antiquity. Equities Research Institute of America. So as you talk about Aurea, what I was referencing earlier in your bio is that um, this is a curriculum that's part of middle and high schools around African studies. So give us a little bit more in-depth overview of what that entails. And just as the system mentioned about the rich history of Black American history, you're talking about countless inventions, discoveries, mm -hmm. Um, you're talking about innovations that have been suppressed because at this particular time when these inventions were happening, African-American people weren't able to patent it. So this is why a lot of things have been suppressed. Even the IBM computer comes from a black man. Many mm. things, there are many discoveries that we're finding that had a black person behind them, but they didn't have the ability to, to patent them at that particular time. So there's a lot of histories, but we want to cover going back, starting with ancient Egypt. We want to go forward to ancient Kush. We want to come into Mali. We want to come into Zululand. We want to go across the African diaspora. We want to go into Europe because the Moors who were ruling Spain for about 700 years, that's great history we need to know. We need to know about, they came before Columbus, how Africans were making frequent travel and trade with the Americas far before Columbus. Um, mm -hmm. And then we want to come down to the present day of African accomplishments. That's in the UK, that's in America, that's in Australia as well, and all mm -hmm. other parts of the world. Africans have been everywhere contributing to uh, innovations in history all over this world since the very beginning of the world. So very yeah, important, know. you know, combine all of this history and not just take um, one picture, one part of the picture and, and call it holistic history, because what, mm -hmm. what that is, it's, it's, it's a small portion of the history, but it's not the whole picture. We want to give mm -hmm. as close as we can get to the whole picture. And we're not going to be dogmatic because just like human services, it's forever growing, forever changing. So is history. We're constantly discovering new things that's going to be added into our curriculum. Yeah, no, that's so good. I, I stand with you, Takia. She says, right, thank you so much for the work that you do. It's necessary for our self-confidence. Yeah, absolutely. As a culture, it is. It's necessary for that self-confidence. Uh, so I'm curious. This is a question that was coming up as you continue to share. I've been to the International African American Museum in D.C. a couple of times now, and you can literally go probably a handful of times and still not see and experience everything. It, it's, it really is remarkable. I'm curious from your perspective. First, have you been and then two, what, I mean, does it do a well, does it do a good job from your point of view and really telling the full holistic history? And what are some areas that you have noticed that maybe you're like, hmm, I'm, I'm more curious as to why this wasn't covered, if it wasn't? Unfortunately, I haven't been there. I plan to make okay. a trip there um, in 2020. Unfortunately, when COVID first happened, yeah, so yeah. it stagnated a lot of things for me. Um, but I do plan to make the trip. I think it's a great effort. 
um, to try to bring forth what happened here. I think it's a, uh, a very, very important. All, every piece of this puzzle of Black history is important. Yeah, you know, every piece. Sometimes we have people who think, well, if we talk about African history, that's not Black history. Well, it's all Black history. This whole thousands of years is all Black history, okay? It's in all pieces of this puzzle are important. We want to make up this holistic picture. We want to get the puzzle in full. We have to put all the pieces together because there was history before that history as well. So we need to have all those pieces, but it's a great effort to restore what African-Americans were dealing with in our accomplishments despite the oppression and suppression. Absolutely, absolutely. So I'm going to go to another question, but I do want to remind this audience that you will have an opportunity shortly to bring forth your questions, your comments, and you can do so by simply using the raise hand feature in Zoom that lets us know that you are willing to be spotlighted and you can unmute yourself and share. Um, or if you would like to place your questions or commentary into the chat, we certainly welcome that as well. But we do hope for some engagement when we uh, present that opportunity momentarily. So um, we've touched on this a little bit in a couple of ways in which you've addressed some of the questions, but I want to go a little bit deeper around the significance and the importance of Black people connecting with their history. Mm -hmm. Culture, and this was told to me by Dr. Kaba Kabane, um, he mentioned culture is to a human as water is to a fish. Mm. You, you live in it, you breathe in it, you eat in it, every, you dress in it. Everything you do is is in it and through it. So if a person is stripped from that, if a people are stripped from their entire culture, just think about for a, a second, you know, I love Italian food, right? If a person who's never been to Italy can be Italian and be never have been to Italy once in their life, but they can tell you about the foods they ate and they can mm -hmm. even tell you some of the words they speak. Yeah. But if you were to ask an African-American about have you ever tried fufu, igusi soup, peanut butter soup, or something like that? They may not know because they've been told so much negative things about Africa. And we go back to when you mentioned about film and media. What are some of the images that we've seen about Africa? We've seen jungle, tribalism, warfare, Ebola, AIDS, yeah. even COVID got thrown in there. This does not make anyone want to go to Africa. Poverty. Mm -hmm. And then, then when you go to the African continent, they have this very same negative image about African-Americans, about street life, gang members, guns and violence, pimps, prostitutes. These are the things that are the images that are being pushed to Africans about African-Americans. Yeah. Now, do you see why it's caused so much division? So when yeah. an African immigrant comes to America, he's, he's leery. He's, he's like, I don't want to be bothered. Because what he's, what he's been shown in his eyes about African-Americans and vice versa when it comes to African-Americans, what they've seen about Africa. You guys are poor. Right. You guys ain't got nothing. You, you know, you sickly people over there. There's nothing, no contribution to the human story over there. So why would I want to be there? So it's created this diaspora divide. And I tend mm -hmm. to think that it's best to embrace the Sankofa mentality to accept it all. You can't just say we were kings and queens and not understand that at times we were slaves and at other times we sold each other and other times we helped each other. We built mega civilizations. You got to accept all of it. You yeah. Get one part of it to understand because we can learn from all of that. We can learn to move forward into a better future. So it's very important to embrace all of the history, uh, to know where we, we, we messed up and to know where we can do better in the future. I appreciate that. I appreciate the fact that um, we are not just trying to tell the good. You know, we, we need the whole picture, the whole story. And and I think that's that's important. I mean, you know, genocide was a big part of what was prevalent, right? And so sometimes we try to not go there. But I think that there is importance for us to make sure that we're capturing both. Um, yeah, someone placed into the chat, the Woman King movie did show that. Yeah, <laughs> Guavana, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, great. So I'm looking around to make sure there aren't any hands raised right now because y'all know me. I will continue to have questions, but I don't want to hog our guests all to myself. So if you have questions, again, I invite you to use the raise hand feature. I would love to spotlight you to be able to share your question or commentary. 
or take to the chat. And um, Kulu right now, I'm not seeing any. So I'm going to go to the next question while people are still percolating on perhaps what they want to share and contribute to this conversation. But I want you to tell us about your upcoming educational seminar, Untold yes. the Golden Age of Africa. Enlighten us, please. This, this seminar will cover from 3200 BC down to the present, the accomplishments of African people around the world. Um, I also will be joined with my one of my my former co-host from the culture show, which she's still a co-host, but we're, we're kind of, we're kind of getting back to our little podcast soon, but she's my partner and she will be helping with the African American side as I will be covering mostly the African side to bring it all the whole diaspora together. So that's going to be uh, again, starting with ancient Egypt. We're going to go into ancient Kush. We're going to touch on uh, Zululand. We're going to touch on Carthage. We're going to touch on Abyssinia in East Africa, Agzum in East Africa. We're going to touch on Mali with, with Mansa Musa. A lot of people have heard about Mansa Musa. Uh, and we're going to touch on other African civilizations as well. The Yashantaway, some of the great queens, the African woman's contribution into world history as well. That's very important. Very important to know, sisters, for all the sisters that's out there, listening that Africa has produced more women rulers than anywhere else in world history. So when people say, why are sisters so strong? Why are they able to do this? How can they go through that? Well, these were women who are ruling kingdoms before. So, <laughs> so they've endured a lot here in America as well. But these were women who were the first women, the first women, I'll say it again, to rule kingdoms. So it's very mm -hmm. important to know. So we're going to be covering a lot of that great information, some of the innovations, some of the discoveries, some of the origin of a lot of things that we see today came from Africa. And I will be breaking that down. Mm, I love that. I love that. I do want to ask about your TED Talk too. But before I go there, there are a couple hands that are raised. And Takia, I think I saw your hand raised first, um, but then it went back down. So I just wanted to make sure before I move on to the next hand, would you like to share at this time? Oh, she said you just answered her question. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> so you must have been reading her mind. And nonetheless, thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate you engaging in the chat and having a question. I'm so glad that Kulu was able to address it. So Kwamina, welcome. Happy New Year to you. I'm going to add you to the spotlight. Let us know your question or comments today for us. All right. Good morning, Amari Ghani. Um, so just wanted to, one, thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Kulu, for being on here today and sharing your insights, experience, um, and your knowledge on all of, all of this subject. Uh, personally, I, I connect with a lot of it uh, in the sense that I, I had the opportunity to travel to multiple different areas of Africa, uh, in Kenya, South Africa, Ghana. Um, ironically, in South Africa and in Kenya, I was mistaken for a local. Uh, which was interesting. And just based on the history of the trades in Kenya um, and the Indian and, and native uh, black uh, Maasai and whatnot uh, mixing. Nonetheless, I also studied um, history of Sub-Saharan Africa in college. To your point, it took me to my you know sophomore year in college to be able to get that information. One of the stories that we uh, read was the Epic of Sunjata. Mm -hmm. um, who was the original king of Mali. I, I'm, I'm assuming you may be familiar with the story. Um, and as we talk about, you know, films and the power of film and the power of like Black Panther um, and how that is spreading information and historical information, have you heard of anyone talking about, you know, creating a uh, full length motion picture about Sunjata and his story? Well, not Sumjata particularly. I've have heard of um I have heard there's a script out there um from Ryan Krugler, who is the director of Black Panther in regards to Mansa Musa of Mali. Um and um and I've also heard there's a script out there about Abu Baka, um, who preceded, who actually was before Mansa Musa. Um, is it gonna come to light? I don't know. Um I also myself am in the works of transforming my book into a film. So I have someone who's in the film industry that's working on uh, showing ancient Egypt in this true Black African sense. 
form that it should be. But I definitely think the Molly story is a very powerful story. Um, I mentioned this in my in my TEDx about how Mansa Musa, when he traveled to Egypt and went to Mecca, traveled through Egypt and went to Mecca, how much gold and wealth he gave to these other nations, which at the time, these nations didn't know, the European nations particularly and the Arab nations didn't really know about the wealth of gold and resources that were in Western Africa at that time until Mansa Musa made this pilgrimage to Mecca. And this kind of awakened them to what was happening in what they call today Sub-Saharan Africa. And this is when we started to see more conquests to Western Africa, which eventually led to colonization. So it's a very important story you're talking about, uh, my brother. I, I have heard about Mansa Musa. Uh, possibly there being a possible Mansa Musa film, but nothing has come to light from that since. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Kwapna, for being here. Okay, so Kulu, I said that I wanted to give you a chance to talk about this TEDx, and you just referenced it quickly. Mm. Um, let us know. What was the message all about, and how can people find it? We'll make sure we place it all into the chat. I got to give a shout out to my sister, Netta Jenkins, first and foremost, because she is the one who hooked me up. She had <laughs> uh, we, we did a discussion um, on on LinkedIn and we talked about this very subject and. It enlightened her so much that she reached out to uh, a TEDx organizer to allow me to be a part of the next TEDx in, in TEDx Alif. And um, I got that opportunity. I was very grateful. And the challenge I had was obviously trying to put 5,000 history, 5,000 years of history into 13, 15 minutes. Yeah. So it was very tough. Um, but we, we got our message across and we even made sure that we included Black American history. We included uh, the Black, uh, Black experience in Europe as well. And also we included the, the historical context going all over Africa. So um, I, it was tough, but we got the job done. Nice. And um, the team was able to actually source that and place it into the chat for, for those who are interested. And I do hope that you will you will check out Hulu's TEDx. Um, so what have we not asked you about today? I'm going to give people maybe another moment or two to percolate on any additional thoughts. And Tiki, I see your hand, so I'm going to go to you. But um, before I do so, Kulu, what have I not asked you about today that you certainly want to make sure that you get a chance to um, express to this, this community? I really want to give, like I, I mentioned briefly about my parents, I always want to give praise to them for their teachings for me to be who I am today, because I got to see the pain and the joy of both sides being an African and being an African American. Without mm -hmm. them coming together and being educators and being lovers of Black history, diaspora Black history, I wouldn't be able to do what I'm doing. So I always want to give praise to my family, my, my parents who, who gave me the jewels that I have to share today. I love that. That is beautiful. Shout out to the parents. Okay. Um, so please unmute yourself, Takaya, and share with us. I'm going to, um, thanks for being here. You've been quite active in the chat and I appreciate that. Adding you to the spotlight. Welcome. Thank you. You know, it's not really a question. It's just really to commend you and thank you for the work that you do. Um, this type of work is really important to me. I'm in human resources at a really uh, newer company and um, I push DEIB. I push really um, inclusivity. We do similar talks like this at the company, which is really exciting. And, you know, I think for me as an African-American um, growing up in America and really seeing firsthand just the divisiveness, you know, I can remember being younger in elementary school and African children coming and us not feeling connected to them and us teasing them and really feeling like we weren't a part of our culture and then going to Hampton, HBCU and really being um just pushed into black culture, it really opened my eyes. And I think for a long time, it was all about black American culture for me. And now to your point, it really is about going deeper and further and learning the truth behind our history for empowerment and also for my little black babies and my children 
and my family. So I just commend you and I thank you for the work you're doing. And it really feels like it is holistic. I love that you do fiction writing. There's so much other fiction writing out there for other cultures. Why not, as you stated, make and show the beauty of our culture? So just thank you. Yes. And, you know, to your point, my sister, my name being Emmanuel Kulu, people noticed, you know, a lot of my own brothers and sisters, my own peers noticed that, you know, I had an African last name and they would say things, Kulu, Zulu, Voodoo, and, you know, kind of make fun of my name. And I would use that as an opportunity to enlighten a lot of my brothers and sisters like, but they would push back. They'd be like, look, Kulu, I, I'm looking in the world history book right here, bro. And I don't see nothing about no kings and queens in Africa. So I would that would always be like my dilemma. Like I wouldn't be able to prove the things I was saying. But I was taught this. I was taught this as a very young man. So I was ahead when it came to that. And as I grew, I realized miseducation is something I'm going to have to fight in order to teach this. So I had to pull my resources together. I had to pull good references in order to validate it. I even had to pull European references to validate these African histories. So it's very important. It's been done. It's been done to keep people from knowing. In the 1960s, the number one, the number one thing to be dealt with when it came to COINTELPRO was to not allow African people, which is people like um, uh, Kwame Nkrumah or uh, people like Patrice Lumumba were talking about the unification of Africa, not to connect with people like Dr. King and people like Malcolm X, because they realized the influence that it can have on the entire diaspora. And as you see, you, you can probably see why these people were all assassinated one way or the other from not allowing them to connect. Towards the end of Malcolm X's life, he realized places like ancient Egypt was a was a place of black history that had been stolen and that needs to be rectified back to black people. So he started mm -hmm. to think more outside of the black American problem. He started to think about a global black diaspora issue. And that's what we have to deal with. Mm, that's fantastic. Thank you so much for your commentary. It was beautifully stated. You're getting some Hampton University love into the chat from Miss Judith. And so, yeah, but um, Faraday is, is um, I'm so I'm glad to have you, I'm sure, because uh, your influence, I'm sure, is making a difference there. So thanks for joining us today as well. We appreciate that. Okay, so we're getting to almost the top of the hours, so maybe just a few minutes left. And um, what I want to do is, um, Kulu, give you a chance to close us out in whatever way that feels appropriate. You can share something that maybe is top of mind for you that we didn't get a chance to touch on, or maybe even let us know what's on the horizon for you. What are you going to be doing all next month? I'm sure it's a busy calendar, Ooh. but what's on the horizon for you? Well, continuing to educate, I have many different universities. If your DEI space is interested in having me speak as well, you can reach out to me at aria, that is A-A-A-R-I-A -A -A dot info at gmail.com. And you can request a speaking engagement where right now, as it was mentioned earlier, we'll be doing Untold the Golden Age of Africa, which is an extensive version of the TEDx talk. So you can check out the TEDx talk. Um, it's a 15 minute version of what I will be doing, an extended version of the 5,000 years of African history that has been excluded from world history. Um, also on top of that, I also wanna throw out there a, a brief story about how I really got started into this when I was a kid. When I was a kid, my father and I, uh, we had to do a project, I believe it was fourth grade. I had to do a project on a historical figure that represents my culture. And um, I chose King Tut. You know, at that time, King Tut was the most known and publicized Egyptian king, African king. So my father and I, we went, we went and got a mannequin, we got some clay, uh, we got some paint and we made a nice um, headdress and we put it on this mannequin, paint, painted it gold, put the outline of the, 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 the royal blue, all of that looked beautiful, took it to school. And my teacher gave me a B minus, y'all. She gave me a B minus. And I was the only one who had like a mannequin in the class or anything. And. I was like downhearted about it because I I really believed I was going to get an A. And I watched my father argue with 
my teacher on why I got a B minus and not a, and she said, because it's historically inaccurate because we paint, make sure he was a black man. So mm-hmm. this also lit the fire in me from a very, very young age on why we must restore the truth on African history, because even my teacher at the time could not believe that King Tut was a black man. So this is why I've continued down this very same path to this very day. Yeah, what a beautiful story. Yeah, we have to unlearn misinformation. I so appreciate you being here. Thank you so much for saying yes to our invitation. We'd love to have you back in the future. Um, we have shared all of your contact info into the um, the chat. So I encourage each of you to reach out and um, have a great weekend. We thank you so much for spending this hour with us. Take care. Bye-bye.